in October 1967, Soviet Russia celebrated the 50th anniversary of the Communist Revolution. Nearly every major American magazine carried feature stories displaying the tremendous progress made by the communists in the fields of science, industry, and technology. This segment of the news media was telling the American people that the communist system was enormously successful, if not wholly desirable. Honest history, however, presents a somewhat different picture of a nation that has, time after time, been saved from disaster through transfusions of food, money, and technology from the West, its avowed enemy. The Great Pretense. How to finance communism while ostensibly opposing it. The takeover of Russia by Bolshevism was not a spontaneous revolution of landless peasants and workers, but was a carefully designed plot, organized and financed from outside of Russia. Lenin was imported into Russia from Germany, and Leon Trotsky left his exile in New York City with a revolutionary cadre determined to make Russia the home of world communism. Revolutions are expensive. The money for the Bolshevik revolution came primarily from Germany and the United States. One of the chief German financiers of the Russian Revolution was M. M. Warburg, who made millions available to the Russian communists through a bank in Sweden. In America, Jacob Schiff, a partner and brother-in-law of Warburg, contributed $20 million to the Russian Revolution. This was rather a strange act for an American, since it was definitely to the detriment of the United States to have Tsarist Russia knocked out of World War I. Three years after the Revolution, Russia presented a picture of untilled fields and idle factories. All was chaos. Production had been reduced to one-seventh of the already low pre-war level. Such was the result of radical socialization. In order to save communism, Lenin ordered a complete about-face. In 1921, he announced his new economic policy, known as NEP. Lenin called upon the mighty industrial powers of the West with their engineers, research scientists, and technologists to come to Russia so that Bolshevik progress might begin. Lenin said of the hated capitalists, quote, they will furnish credits which will serve as a means to support the communist parties, and by supplying us with materials and techniques which are not available to us, they will rebuild our war industry, which is essential to our future attacks on our own suppliers. In other words, they will be laboring to prepare their own suicide. Lenin was right, for the West took the bait. Historian Werner Keller, in his excellent book, East Minus West Equals Zero, describes how capitalism built communism. The first modern aircraft factory in Russia was built by the German Junkers concern. Thus, Soviet air power was born. Large numbers of Soviet engineers and workers were trained. Many hundreds of Russian pilots were thoroughly instructed by German test pilots, and the first Russian airline network was created. Eventually, the Soviets began to cold shoulder the Junkers people, exactly as they would do in the case of other concessionaires when the foreigners from the West had fulfilled their function. After 1925, the USSR began withdrawing one concession after another and breaking the agreements made in their original contracts. The Red Army was also built by Germany because Germany was forbidden by the Versailles Treaty to maintain an army or to manufacture arms. Communist Russia offered Germany a unique chance to evade the treaty. Moscow willingly made suitable training areas available to the German army so that it might continue undisturbed behind the Iron Curtain by developing and testing its weapons on maneuvers. The Germans established a flying school, an armored vehicle school, and a chemical warfare research unit within Russia. Large-scale production of new tanks and military aircrafts were begun by the Germans in Russian factories. German officers secretly trained the Red Army, including many of Russia's future generals. Russia's most famous general, Gregory Zhukov, was himself a product of German staff schools. Ultra-modern gold mining installations were constructed in Russia by Lena Goldfields Limited, an English firm. As soon as the gold field was developed, the English were ousted. The gold mine from the Lena field by hundreds of thousands of slave laborers provided much of the money with which Russia paid the capitalists for building the industrial capacity of the USSR. Other foreign exchange money was obtained by deliberately starving to death millions of Russians so that wheat could be exported. The United States has been Russia's prime patron ever since the Russian Revolution. 
In 1921, Herbert Hoover set up an international organization to end famine in Russia. The United States alone sent 700,000 tons of foodstuffs. This was a prime example of misplaced idealism and charity. While many lives were saved, the communist system was also saved, with the result that millions have lost their lives and the Russian people were deprived of their best opportunity to throw off the yoke of their slave masters. Even though there were no diplomatic relations between Moscow and Washington, American industrialists made private agreements with the Soviet Union. Thus, U.S. firms acquired gold prospecting rights. The Standard Oil Company won an oil boring concession. Averill Harriman built mines to work manganese ore deposits. General Electric sold Moscow electrical equipment to the value of over $20 million and other American firms set about re-equipping Russian industry. From 1921 to 1925, 37 million dollars of machinery and equipment were pumped into the Soviet economy by American industry. In 1928, the NEP was replaced by the first five-year plan, which promised to transform the Soviet Union from an agricultural into an industrial economy. Such a vast project was impossible without the active help of Western industry and its unlimited supplies and expert technical knowledge. By the time the first plan was announced, the essential contracts had already been signed by Western firms, which was why the Soviets appeared so confident in projecting their goals. Unobserved by the American public, some of the largest American industrial concerns which were steadily insulted in the Soviet press as, quote, the last strongholds of imperialist capitalism began doing business with the communists. Orders worth millions of dollars poured into the offices of these great firms. In 1930, the Bolsheviks arranged for the Ford Motor Company to establish the Russian motor car industry. The Soviet representatives signed contracts with Henry Ford for patent licenses, technical assistance and advice, plus an inventory of spare parts. Ford technicians were sent to Russia to train the Russians in assembling automobiles. The factory was to be capable of turning out 140,000 cars a year, and an Ohio construction company contracted to build the factory. The town of Gorky was transformed into the Detroit of Russia. The Russian steel industry is another example of Russian power made in the USA. A Cleveland firm contracted to do nothing less than rebuild a copy of the city of Gary, Indiana, the center of American iron and steel industry on Russian soil. This was to be the huge Soviet steel complex, Magnitogorsk. Without iron, there can be no steel. Without steel, no heavy industry. And without heavy industry, no Bolshevik power to bury the West. Americans made Magnitogorsk the biggest iron and steel works in the world. Tractors were a necessity to modernize Soviet agriculture. A Detroit engineer designed and constructed a tractor factory without parallel in any other country. The assembly works were 2,000 feet long and 650 feet wide, covering an area of 30 acres. The tractors produced were copies of the American Caterpillar Company, but there were no arrangements made for payment for use of the patent. Russia merely bought one sample and copied it. The factory was so designed that production could be adapted almost overnight to the production of another less innocuous commodity, tanks. The communists achieved a propaganda victory by distributing millions of pictures around the globe of the world's largest hydroelectric installation and dam at Niprogus. It was considered a classic of communist development. Actually, it represented the peak of American achievement. It was designed and built by Colonel Hugh Cooper, who built the dam at Muscle Shoals, Tennessee. The power plant increased Russia's hydroelectric system output by six times and produced more power the Niagara Falls. Still, by 1933, Russia was once again on the verge of collapse. And again, it was America which saved the communist regime, this time through official diplomatic recognition of the communists. On the verge of financial collapse, Russia had been staying alive by what amounted to the kiting of checks on an international level. When President Franklin D. Roosevelt reversed the position of four other United States presidents and recognized the legitimacy of the communist government, the prestige and thereby the credit of the communist skyrocketed overnight. In return for recognition, Maxim Litvinov promised FDR that the American communist would cease calling for the overthrow of the United States government and the establishment of a red dictatorship in America. 
It was not until the advent of World War II that the anti-American propaganda was played down in the American communist press, which at that time had a circulation of millions. Ignoring the Russian invasion of Poland, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, and Finland, the American government and the American press heralded the Soviets as great believers in liberty and democracy during World War II. In view of the communist unbroken record of calling for world conquest by communist imperialism, there was no reason why anyone in America should have been so fooled. But once again, the United States saved the Soviet Union from destruction through the medium of Lend-Lease. While many Americans felt that the world's two worst criminal dictators, Hitler and Stalin, should be allowed to fight each other to the death, America intervened with all its might on the side of the Red Dictator. A man in charge of Russian Lend-Lease was the mysterious Harry Hopkins, the alter ego of Franklin D. Roosevelt, who actually lived in the White House. Writer-historian William Henry Chamberlain has written that Hopkins was, quote, after the president, the most powerful man in America during the war. Hopkins, at a Russian aid rally in Madison Square Garden in June 1942, said, quote, we are determined that nothing shall stop us from sharing with you all that we have. Major General John Dean, an expert on Russian Lindley, said that Hopkins' desire to help the Russians was, quote, carried out with a zeal which approached fanaticism. Materials destined for General MacArthur in the South Pacific were rerouted to Russia through the influence of Harry Hopkins. In letters to American agencies dated March 7, 1942, President Roosevelt ordered that preferential position in matters of munitions should be given to the Soviet Union over all other allies, and even the armed forces of the United States. Major General Dean later wrote that then and there was, quote, the beginning of a policy of appeasement of Russia from which we have never recovered and from which we are still suffering. American help went to the Soviet Union at the crucial moment. It is officially estimated that the U.S. sent the USSR over $11 billion in goods, plus the cost of transportation to Russia. Russia, of course, has never repaid a single cent. Vice President Henry Wallace addressed the American people over radio on July 9, 1944, after returning from a trip to Russia. He gloated, quote, I found American flour in the Soviet Far East, American aluminum in Soviet airplane factories, American steel in trucks and railway repair shops, American machine tools in shipbuilding yards, American compressors and electrical equipment on Soviet naval vessels. American electric shovels in open-cut coal mines, American core drills in the copper mines of Central Asia, and American trucks and planes performing strategic transportation functions. Over half the value of goods sent were non-munitions. The variety of goods shipped to Russia runs into the thousands, consisting of almost every product imaginable. It has been called the greatest mail-order catalog in history. What did America send to Russia between 1941 and 1945? 2,660 ships with a total cargo of 16 and a quarter million tons left American ports for the Soviet Union. America donated over 15,000 planes to the Soviets. The Russian transportation system, which had almost broken down, was completely re-equipped. 1,900 steam locomotives and 66 diesels were sent by the U.S., together with 10,000 railway cars, shipload after shipload of machine tools, Complete industrial plants, spare parts and armaments, textiles and footwear were unloaded in Russian ports. Of inestimable value were the supplies of foodstuffs. Nearly four and one half million tons of tin meat, sugar, flour and fats were sent from America. Gold mining equipment from American mines which had been closed by government orders were shipped to the Russians at the express orders of the Treasury Department's Harry Dexter White who was later proven by the FBI to be a Soviet spy. According to Viktor Kravchenko, who defected from the Soviet Union after serving in America during World War II, all Russian personnel sent to this country during the war had two jobs. First, his regular job, and second, that of being a spy. Among the agents posing as unimportant minor officials were famous scientists and high-ranking officers with special technical qualifications. Some of the Soviet experts were camouflaged as ordinary workmen. Their job was the theft of technical and scientific secrets from American industrial concerns. 
The headquarters of the Soviet espionage ring was in Washington and the Soviet Purchasing Commission called AMTORG, which was officially concerned with administering Lend-Lease. The government watched the activities of the Soviet agents with incredible tolerance. The worst that could happen to an agent was a polite request that he leave the country. In such cases, an official of the FBI would accompany the agent to the boat or plane leaving for Moscow, but without checking his luggage or briefcase. Among the items obtained by MTORG spies were designs of industrial plants, special machines, parts and details, photographs and blueprints of technical processes in aviation, arms, oil, submarine building and many other industries, plus complete maps of the United States and locations of strategic defense plants and military installations. The technical information stolen by the Russians was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. The tens of tons of stolen documents, plans, and other technical data were shipped to Russia across the Arctic by airplane or were packed into the holes of Soviet cargo ships with no customs inspection because they had diplomatic immunity. With tools, machinery, or apparatus too heavy or too bulky for this procedure, the Soviets developed another technique. The goods were declared as something other than what they were. For example, secret radar sets were declared as truck engines which were permitted exports under Lend-Lease. Tens of thousands of patents were copied and shipped in diplomatic pouches to the Soviet Union. Our patent office was thrown open to a crew of technical experts from the Amtorg Corporation. They were on full-time duty and spent every day going over the files to pick out what they wanted. The House Committee on Un-American Activities stated in 1949 that the number of patents acquired, quote, runs into the hundreds of thousands. Included in the patents were top military items. The Communists not only had access to military proving grounds where the most secret weapons were under development, but also the State Department issued an order allowing the Russians to visit any restricted industrial plant and to take motion pictures of intricate machinery and manufacturing processes. FBI reports on all of this piled up in Washington, but the government kept these reports confidential and did nothing about it. One of the first persons to expose this incredible story was Major George Racy Jordan, who, in 1949, before a congressional committee, revealed diaries that he had kept while in charge of expediting Lend-Lease to Russia from the giant Great Falls, Montana Air Base. Major Jordan had kept meticulous records to the unbelievable manner in which the Russians were allowed to ship goods and documents out of the country. Many of the cargo planes which left Great Falls contained three to 4,000 pounds of mail for the Soviet Union. Americans were not allowed to inspect these consignments which were carried in large cheap black suitcases and accompanied by two guards under order to ensure there were no checks. The event which motivated Major Jordan to make his diaries available was the explosion in September 1949 of an atom bomb by the Soviets. Major Jordan testified that included among the shipments of strategic goods out of Great Falls to Russia were quantities of heavy water and uranium. At the time, Major Jordan, like almost all other Americans, knew nothing of the significance of heavy water and uranium. He had been ordered over the telephone by Harry Hopkins to expedite certain experimental chemicals to Russia and leave it off the records. This was uranium ore which was shipped from Canada. The bills of lading are shown here. Major Jordan said of this shipment, quote, it was the only one out of a tremendous multitude of consignments that I was ordered not to enter on my tally sheet. It was the only one I was forbidden to discuss with my superiors and the only one I was directed to keep secret from everybody. American military intelligence in charge of the Manhattan Project, as the atom bomb experiments were called, blocked most shipments of uranium to Russia. Therefore, the Russians went around military intelligence with the help of Harry Hopkins and got the uranium directly from Canada. Another major shipment of uranium was disguised as a commercial transaction within American territory and was shipped by the Eastman Kodak Company. Over 13 million dollars of aluminum tubes used to cook or transmute uranium into plutonium were sent to Russia. Almost 900,000 pounds of cadmium metal rods to control the intensity of the atomic pile were lend leased to the Reds, along with 3,600 tons of natural graphite and 437 tons of cobalt. All of these materials were scarce in the United States. In September 1949, the Russians exploded their first atomic bomb, years ahead of what any expert had predicted. Three months later, on January 27, 1950, Klaus Fuchs, 
who had worked on the Manhattan Project, was arrested in England. He had betrayed to Russia the most strictly guarded secret of all, the secret of the atom bomb. Since early 1942, Fuchs had been supplying the Soviets with every scrap of secret atomic information available to him. Fuchs was actually on the spot at Los Alamos, New Mexico, when the first atom bomb was detonated. Unknown to Fuchs, another Soviet spy was present, the American scientist David Greenglass. For six months, Fuchs belonged to the innermost circle of top-grade scientists which J. Robert Oppenheimer had assembled in Los Alamos. Oppenheimer himself had been making financial contributions to the Communist Party. The Soviets had collaborators, agents, and informers in all key points of the Manhattan Project. Mountains of reports, drawings, blueprints, and photostats were piling up in Moscow from such spies as Alan Nunn May, Clarence Hiskey, John Chapin, Joseph Weinberg, Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, and many more. The number was so large that a vast Soviet staff was occupied solely with checking and evaluating the reports collected by their agents and delivered to Moscow. The Russian scientists and technicians had everything they needed for technical calculations, down to detailed drawings of the most intricate precision parts and the most complicated equipment. Without this advantage, it would have taken 10 years at least to arrive at the stage reached by the United States in 1945. Gaps in the Soviet atomic program were to be filled by the tremendous campaign of looting Germany in 1945. 200 German scientists and engineers were deported and forced to work in the Soviet atomic laboratories. Thus, once again, the equation East minus West equals zero was proven valid. Yet the East had stolen the world's most potent weapon through the cooperation of a few key figures in the free world. The looting of the United States during World War II by the Russians was equaled or surpassed by the Soviets' looting of Germany. The Kremlin received $10 billion from Germany as compensation for war damage. However, expropriations were worth at least four times this amount. In occupying eastern Germany, the Soviets acquired 41% of Germany's 1943 industrial capacity. Contrary to popular belief, at the end of the war, the majority of German industry was still standing and in operation. The Russians dismantled whole factories which were taken in bits and packed up down to the last electric light socket and the last ashtray from the boss office and shipped by railroad to Russia. The Allies even agreed to meet a Russian reparation claim for 26% of the equipment in Western Germany. The Soviets received from the British and American zones all the patents, open and secret, of both heavy and light industry, and it cost them nothing. Moscow had only to order photostats from London and Washington. While Russia looted Germany, the United States rebuilt Germany through the Marshall Plan, thereby indirectly building Russian industry. The Marshall Plan rebuilt Germany not only because it had been destroyed by bombers, but also because it had been looted by the Russians. Russia also kidnapped an army of technicians, scientists, and specialists to rebuild and run the factories in Russia. In the autumn of 1957, the Soviet Union announced it had succeeded in sending the first artificial satellites into space. The Sputniks completely overwhelmed and astonished the West. The story behind this event went back 12 years to April 11, 1945, when advanced units of General Patton's 3rd Armored Division captured the small town of Nordhausen in Germany. Located near Nordhausen was the heart of Germany's V-2 rocket program. Two days later, however, the Americans were ordered to evacuate the vast underground factory and to turn it over to the Russians. General Dwight Eisenhower had signed an order to the effect that, quote, all factories, installations, works, research institutes, laboratories, patents, plans, drawings, and inventions must be placed intact and in good condition at the disposal of the Allied representatives. This order originated in the Yalta Conference in which Roosevelt and Churchill had agreed to Stalin's request for 80% of German industry as reparations. Fortunately, Major I.P. Hamil disobeyed what he apparently felt were treasonous orders and removed hundreds of almost completed V-2 rockets and a number of valuable documents from the underground arsenal. In 1945, the Germans were already working on a long-range rocket. Its eventual use as a carrier rocket for satellites was also envisaged. Over 1,000 machine tools for the production of rockets and mountains of documents, all stamped top secret 
were turned over to the Soviets, including blueprints for the future development of the V-2 and the completed plans for putting satellites into space. Lieutenant Colonel Vladimir Shabensky, a Russian officer in charge of looting the Nordhausen factory who later defected to the West, said that when the works was complete, the Russians drank toast shouting, quote, what fools these Americans are. The Nordhausen factory itself was subsequently moved, lock, stock and wind tunnel, to the Soviet Union, where German scientists and German facilities became the nucleus of Russia's vaunted space program. As the haze of smoke slowly lifted from the pulverized cities of Europe, it soon became apparent who had really won the Second World War. The Soviet Union could count enormous territorial gains and a vast amount of human skill and industrial potential had fallen into its lap. We went to war to guarantee that every nation in the world would be free from foreign domination. Then we turned over European and Asian nations to the communists. The gobbling up of Central Europe and the inserting of communist puppet regimes was partially financed by billions of American dollars given through UNRRA, supposedly to help war-ravaged Europe. Under the guise of stopping communism, the foreign aid program was instituted. We have now spent 152 billion for foreign aid. While some of it has been useful, much of it has gone to socialist and communist countries. The communists have kept their peoples in slavery with American foreign aid money. After 20 years of foreign aid, freedom is in retreat all over the world. Communism has been a perennial failure in food production. The red slave empire cannot feed itself without food from the West. Although it is a closely guarded secret how much wheat we have provided the Soviets, in the span of little over one month during 1964, America delivered to Soviet Russia over 65 million bushels of wheat. This is the equivalent of one bushel of wheat for every third man, woman and child in the Soviet Union. The wheat deal was subsidized by American taxpayers to the tune of $42 million, according to former Secretary of Agriculture, Ezra Taft Benson. Meanwhile, Russia was shipping wheat to Cuba, and some of it was employed to produce ethyl alcohol used in certain types of missile fuels. Those who support the diversion of Russian workers from the fields to the war factories to produce weapons to kill American soldiers defend their actions on the grounds that it is humanitarian and good business. The Vietnam War is now the longest war in American history. Many Americans are baffled over the inability of the world's most powerful nation to win a war with a 30th rate power the size of the state of Missouri. The answer lies in the interlocking policies of no win combined with aid to and trade with the communists. Illustrative of our policy of feeding the hand that bites us is an article printed in a European newspaper and reprinted in the Chicago Tribune of December 26, 1966. Weapons of the Polish armed forces are being shipped from Stettin Harbor in Poland in ever-increasing quantities to North Vietnam harbors, while on one side of the Stettin Harbor, American wheat is being unloaded from freighters. On the other side of the same harbor, weapons are loaded which are being used to kill American soldiers. The Poles receive the wheat from the U.S. on credit, and they in turn ship their weapons to North Vietnam on credit. President Johnson stated concerning Vietnam, Quote, this is war. Yet, on October 7, 1966, the president stated, quote, we intend to press for legislative authority to negotiate trade agreements which could extend most favored nation tariff treatment to European communist states. We will reduce export controls on east-west trade with respect to hundreds of non-strategic items. I have just signed a determination that will allow the Export-Import Bank to guarantee commercial credits to four additional Eastern European countries. We do not intend to let our differences in Vietnam or elsewhere prevent us from exploring all opportunities. A war which had claimed over 200,000 American casualties was referred to as, quote, our differences by the president. Of course, the more we bolster the communist economy through trade, the more jets, rockets, trucks, and missiles they can send to Vietnam. And the communist bloc is the arsenal of Ho Chi Minh, providing at least 80% of the war-making material used in the war. Therefore, our enemy is not just North Vietnam, but the entire communist bloc of nations who are fighting us by proxy. While fighting the tentacles of the communist octopus, we feed its body. Fighting them in Vietnam while we help them in every other place is described by the government as a, quote, 
flexible policy. President Johnson was not kidding when he spoke of building bridges with the communists in October 1966. On October 13th, the New York Times announced that the Department of Commerce had authorized shipment of more than 400 heretofore strategic items to communist countries. The administration took no chances on obtaining congressional approval of its communist trade expansion program, but did it by executive order. According to the New York Times, among the 400 items which became non-strategic at the stroke of a pen were rubber, petroleum, chemical compounds, medicines, plastics, metal products, machinery, and scientific and professional instruments. It is significant to note that our government now considers petroleum as non-strategic. U.S. News and World Report of January 30th, 1967 stated, the North Vietnamese war machine runs almost entirely on Russian oil. It was the hope of millions that the Nixon administration would bring about drastic changes in our foreign policy and that President Nixon would bring about a halt to our suicidal trade with the communists. However, these hopes were dashed on November 12, 1968, only seven days after his election, when President-elect Nixon announced, quote, no foreign policy shift. This was emphasized on February 10, 1969, when Secretary of Agriculture Clifford Hardin said he favored the continued sale of wheat to Russia, even though some of it might ultimately reach communist China. In Vietnam, we are at war against ourselves. We are, in essence, financing and equipping both sides. Hardly anyone would suggest we sell missiles and tanks to the communists. However, we send machinery that can be used to produce tanks and missiles and call that peaceful trade. Without our help to communist countries, the war in Vietnam would be over within a few weeks. Without our aid in trade, the communist arsenals would dry up. Yet this surest and most humane way of winning the war in Vietnam is never discussed by Washington or the mass media. Instead, we are sending the communists such non-strategic products as airborne radar equipment, metal cutting machines, turbines, generators, IBM computers, pipeline compressors, nuclear radiation and detection instruments, railway equipment, and jet engines. During World War II, anyone who advocated providing the Nazis with such equipment would have been universally denounced as crazy or worse. During that war, we lost hundreds of airplanes and thousands of aviators bombing the critical German ball-bearing works at Schweinfurt. Today, we sell the communist ball-bearings, on credit, of course. Our first representative at the Paris Peace Conferences, Averill Harriman, said that those who oppose aid and trade with communists are, quote, bigoted and pig-headed. The State Department has issued a pamphlet heaping scorn on those who oppose trading with the communists. The pamphlet states, quote, this small group has tried to label our moderate peaceful trade with Eastern European countries as a sellout to communism. According to a Joint Chiefs of Staff report, we not only indirectly supply the Viet Cong, we also guarantee to keep the supply lines open by failing to destroy the communist ships delivering the war materials. An American pilot can fly over a Soviet ship carrying ground-to-air missiles made with metals from mills built with United States foreign aid money, but he is under orders not to bomb that ship. The next day, the missiles from that ship may kill him. Even more incredible than allowing the communists to deliver war material by sea is the fact that the U.S. is helping to build a highway complex which will link the USSR with nearly all of Southeast Asia, including Vietnam. Unknown to virtually all Americans, the United States since 1959 has been working with communist Russia to build a paved highway from the Soviet Union to Singapore. While the value of red trade is enormously important to the communists, it is insignificant as a stimulus to the American economy. Supporters of the Red Traders in Congress justify the subsidizing of the communist by claiming that it helps our chronic balance of payments deficits. Yet these same congressmen continue voting to pour out billions of dollars a year in foreign aid, the real cause of the balance of payments deficits. Congressman Glenn Lipscomb, one of the few congressmen who has openly opposed aid and trade to the communists, has stated, quote, the cost of replacing U.S. attack aircraft destroyed during the current fiscal year 1966, by weapons built by the Soviet Union and Communist Eastern Europe, could be at least five times the dollar value of U.S. exports to the Eastern Communist bloc. In 1964, the Judiciary Committee of the United States Senate compiled a symposium entitled 
the many crises of the Soviet economy. After proving that profits from trade with the Soviet bloc nations was negligible and not advantageous to the United States, the report stated, quote, on the communist side, however, east-west trade, despite its apparently limited dollar volume, is not merely of critical importance. It may be a matter of survival. The communist bloc must have western assistance not only in coping with its chronic agricultural crises, but also to cope with the chronic deficiencies of its industries. Much of what is deceptively called trade with the communist countries is really another form of foreign aid. The communists receive almost everything on credit. Payment for goods sold to the communists is guaranteed American businessmen by the Import-Export Bank. The Import-Export Bank was not set up by Congress, but by Presidential Executive Order Number 6581 on February 2nd, 1934. The bank was established in order to foster trade with Russia. The bank is financed by the American taxpayers who will pay any bills on which the communists default. The fact is that no private businessman or banker will extend the communist credit unless payment is guaranteed by the U.S. Treasury. Representative Paul Fino, in congressional hearings concerning the expansion of the Export-Import Bank, stated, quote, For those who do not believe such credits are risky, let me point out how West Germany's Krupp Empire, now all but collapsed, owes much of its difficulty to overextension of credits to the Soviets. While the newspapers, magazines, and television are capable of publishing and reporting infinite amounts of information about some things, aid and trade with the enemy is apparently a taboo subject. The so-called establishment is moving heaven and earth to keep the American people from learning the truth about these policies. During the 1968 presidential campaign, neither major party discussed the subject. Since this dynamite issue undoubtedly could not only have assured the Republicans the White House, but also control of Congress, why was the issue never broached? Possibly because one of the most powerful men in the Republican Party controls much of the blood trade with the Reds. He is Nelson Rockefeller, who in December of 1966 formed a partnership with Cleveland industrialist and Moscow favorite Cyrus Eaton to expand trade with the communist nations. Eaton is the only private American citizen known ever to entertain top Soviet officials, having personally entertained both Khrushchev and Kosygin in his home. In addition, he made an unauthorized trip to communist Cuba in December 1968. Besides promoting trade, Rockefeller is arranging to construct strategic synthetic rubber and aluminum factories behind the Iron Curtain and has reached an agreement with the official Soviet licensing and patent organization covering licensing and patent transactions. The Eaton-Rockefeller Combine, according to the New York Times, was to take over the buying of licenses and patents from the Amtorg Trading Corporation, innocently described by the Times as, quote, the official Soviet agency in this country for promoting Soviet-American trade. The Times quotes Cyrus Eaton as complaining that Amtorg had difficulty in trying to arrange agreements with American companies. As you can imagine, Eaton said, it is almost impossible for a Russian to walk into the research department of an American aerospace company and try to arrange the purchase of a patent. Eaton and Rockefeller are therefore relieving the communists of this difficulty by serving as official agents of the communist. Is it then surprising that the Republicans would not or could not make an election issue of aid and trade with the communists? Lenin claimed, when the time comes for us to hang the capitalist, they will compete with each other for the profits of selling us the rope. Lenin also declared, the cultured class of the capitalist countries of Western Europe and America, that is, the ruling classes, the financial aristocracy, the bourgeoisie, and the idealistic democrats, should be regarded as deaf mutes and treated accordingly. They will grant us credits which will fill the coffers of the communist organizations in their countries while they enlarge and improve our armaments industry by supplying all kinds of wares which we shall need for future attacks against our suppliers. The excuse offered for this suicidal policy of building bridges to communism is that the Red Empire is fragmented and that Russia no longer controls our East European satellites. We have been told for 20 years that communism is not a monolithic force, that these are separate countries going their own independent ways. But on the most important issue in this country today, the killing of American soldiers, they are completely united. In Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, there is no disagreement. They like what the Viet Cong have been doing, and they are going to help them and their equivalent in other countries do more of it. 
the idea of the decentralization of communism was thoroughly discredited by the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia. But the American mass media was stony in its silence over the disintegration of the communism is mellowing theory. Liberals in and out of the government seemed concerned only that the Russian invasion of Czechoslovakia would interrupt the bridge building. They continue to talk of convergence between the United States and the communists on the idea that we are moving from capitalism to socialism and the Russians are supposedly moving from totalitarian communism to democratic socialism. This nonsense that the communists have given up their goal of world domination comes not from the communists themselves, but from American liberals. Khrushchev claimed that the communists would not abandon Marxist-Leninism until Schrems learned to whistle. Mr. K also said, quote, when we spit in the face of an American, he thinks it is due. As long as our leaders continue to insist that it is due, the communist will be eternally on the offensive while we are in perpetual retreat. And the enemy will never quit as long as we pay them to continue. And that is precisely what our leaders are doing today. It has become profitable for communists to kill our son. Aiding our enemies is not a happenstance. It is a deliberate policy on the part of certain American government and business leaders with the wholehearted support of the intellectual and communications communities. It is an establishment program to build up the communist nations so that East and West can be amalgamated into a one-world socialist superstate. Socialism has shown over and over again that as an economic system, it is a colossal flop. Almost everything the communists have, they have been given or they have stolen from the West. Time after time, communism would have collapsed if it had not been rescued by the non-communist world. The communists are parasites who live off the blood of the free world. The communist empire will collapse of its own weight if we would just stop propping it up. Their Achilles' heel is that they cannot grow enough food to feed their peoples or produce enough goods to provide a decent standard of living for their slave citizens. More than anyone else, the victims of communism pray for its collapse. All Americans who truly want peace must oppose our trading with the enemy. Just as the Soviets are using trade as a weapon for the conquest of the world, America could use trade as a vehicle to promote freedom. Trade should be a part of our arsenal for Cold War victory, not defeat. Our so-called allies should be forced to choose between trade with the United States and trade with the communists. We must dramatize American might and Soviet myth. What can you do as an individual citizen? American financing of communist aggression continues only because so few Americans are aware of its existence. The job begins with educating and creating understanding about foreign aid and international trade so that we can put a stop to this suicidal policy. You can arrange for this film to be shown to clubs, business organizations, and neighborhood groups. You can distribute pamphlets exposing aid and trade with the communist enemy and obtain signatures on petitions to have it stopped. You can write your senators and congressmen and demand that they take a stand for our American men and against the red traders. Probably the most effective action is to join a local train committee. Train committees are groups of local citizens who are concerned about our long-range foreign policy. Their immediate goal is to create sufficient grassroots understanding about American aid to the communist bloc countries. This aid is being converted to war material to kill American soldiers. Your influence is invaluable. Exert that influence now and help save American lives. If the United States of America falls victim to red tyranny and slavery, it will have been an inside job and the epitaph will read, Here lies America, murdered by the guns she gave her avowed enemies. The insiders have built the communist world on your tax dollars, moving like a spreading cancer. We have discovered the disease. Now tell the surgeons in our nation's capital you want it cut out. Then make certain we maintain a constant alert for new symptoms. We must keep our patient alive. She is the only one history has ever known.